The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Welcome to International Insights. I am Doug Davis, and with me is Michael Sabachkov. On this episode, we will be speaking with Major General William J. Walker. The Honorable William J. Walker was sworn in as the 38th Sergeant of Arms of the U.S. House of Representatives on April 26, 2021, and served the 117th Congress. Previously, he served by presidential appointment as the 23rd Commanding General of the District of Columbia National Guard. General Walker led the National Guard civil support to the U.S. Capitol Police following the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol and subsequently provided command and control for over 28,000 guardsmen assigned for the 59th presidential inauguration. General Walker has also served in the Drug Enforcement Agency. General Walker, welcome to the show from Maryland. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. We, and I'll just, the DEA agents, we get, uh, we, we like the Drug Enforcement Administration, not, not agency. i just share that with you. Okay, I appreciate Perfect. that. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. General Walker, I'd like to uh, ask you, the U.S. House of Representatives Sergeant of, at Arms is an important elected position, and you were nominated for this position by former Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi. Can you please describe the duties of the Sergeant at Arms? Incredible duties, uh, extremely important. What an honor to have uh, the speaker in, uh, request that I become the Sergeant of Arms. So, so on a day-to-day -day basis, we are involved in the security of the Capitol complex. The House Sergeant Arms has the House office buildings and the House portion of the Capitol. And we're also responsible for the safety and security of 435 members and their families. Uh, part of the, when I was there, I instituted the residential security program where if a member requested it, we could outfit, no capital improvements to the home, but we could outfit the home with uh, state-of-the-art security and alarm systems. But a great job, uh, as you, you mentioned on the 26th, I, I was sworn in on the 28th I walked the President of the United States down the aisle of a um, joint session of Congress and introduced him to the members and, and Madam Speaker, the President of the United States of America. It was an amazing, um, extraordinary experience. But, but I was also responsible for protocol, uh, parking around the complex. Uh, the garages came under me, police services law enforcement, um, emergency management, continuity of government. The, the, it, was, it's a, it was a big job, but, a, but an extraordinary uh, opportunity to serve. Excellent, excellent. You became Sergeant of Arms soon after January 6, 2021. At that time, you were the commanding general of the DC National Guard. Could you please describe what you remember from that day and what did you learn from that day? I remember everything about that day. I will never forget that day. Um, it, it was in a, <laughs> to me, it was, it was a moment like uh, forever in my mind, it'd be one of these, where were you when? So I clearly remember exactly where I was on September 11th. I was at DEA headquarters, which is right across the street from the Pentagon. So we actually heard the explosion and we felt we felt it at DEA headquarters. And quite frankly, I was supposed to be in the Pentagon. That was my, I drilled at the Pentagon. Drilling is what uh, guard guardsmen and reservists do at least one week in a month or sometimes during the week. So I had a Pentagon uh, escort badge. I could escort up to seven people. And I, I, was, I was with DEA, but I was assigned to the White House. Uh, so I would show up at DEA headquarters around eight o'clock, take part in the global 
operations briefing, Ketra Metro over to the White House, and I had promised to bring a group and give them a tour to the Pentagon. Well, I never made it to work um, that day to the White House, but we went over and start helping people. Uh, DA has a pretty large medical facility at our headquarters. So we, the medical staff came out and we start helping with the triage of, uh, of the wounded. And then within two weeks, I was mobilized into the army and served in the Pentagon for a little bit more than 15 months as an operations and, uh, and action officer. I'm a intel officer by training, and I'm also a strategist by, by training. So I was in the Pen Pentagon's, uh, the Emergency Operations Center of the U.S. Army. Uh, so I will never forget that day, how frustrated I was um, that it took so long to get approval from the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Army for us to get to that capital less than two miles away. And I know we could have made a difference. Uh, I had a lot of soldiers and airmen asking me, why aren't we there? I mean, the whole world was watching and, and we were waiting where we were trained. We had the summer of uh, George Floyd, that civil unrest. We had, uh, we were out there for COVID. We were out there for when the monuments were being attacked. So we have proven our ability to um, allow people to protest. We all have that right, but to do so peacefully and, and prevent harm and destruction. So I will remain uh, disappointed in how long it took us to arrive to the Capitol and support the United States Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police Department. By the time we got there, there were the New Jersey State Police were there, the transit police were there. Everybody was, you know, coming. We cannot let the citadel of democracy, the symbol of, of everything that we hold sacred to us as, as a democracy. So to answer your question, I vividly recall it. I will never forget it. It was a very frustrating time. Thomas Jefferson created the D.C. Guard in 1802. And, and I didn't spend my whole career in the D.C. Guard. I was in the Florida Guard, the Illinois Guard, the New Jersey Guard. I used to drill in Puerto Rico when I lived there. So I kept getting transferred around, but I eventually landed in the District of Columbia National Guard. I read the history, and I decided I was going to stay in the District of Columbia National Guard. It proved to be fortuitous because I kept getting promoted and uh, became the commanding general, the 23rd commanding general by presidential appointment, as you mentioned. But when I was in New York with DEA, I would just Amtrak back and forth uh, to the district. But it was very frustrating for my soldiers and airmen, Capitol Guardians, that's what we're called, Capitol Guardians. And on our uniforms, we wear the Capitol. It, it's right there on the uniform. So if you look up uh, a guardsman and, and go to uh, photos, if you'll see on their shoulder, we wear uh, the Capitol and we're supposed to protect the Capitol and defend the nation. So we were very disappointed. A lot of my soldiers and airmen were frustrated because we were out there uh, when the White House was locked down. We went right to the White House, no problem, uh, following the George Floyd protest. We were out there, like I said, for the monuments that were being destroyed, and we no further damage to to the monuments. And we were out there for COVID, so we were we proved ourselves in a. We were out there for the um, anniversary of the Martin Luther King uh, March on Washington. So well trained, well equipped, mentally prepared, and motivated to do what we signed up for. So that was a long answer to. I, I, will, I will always remember that day. General, I'd like to ask uh, another question from that day, and that is, according to the January 6th commission, uh, you considered sending guardsmen to the Capitol and then retired due to having circumvented the chain of command because you were frustrated, as, as you mentioned. How accurate is this report, 
And how difficult was it to not may uh, not issue that order uh, or that command to to uh, send troops to the capital. Yes, so so that is accurate. I I um, not just contemplated. I, I had directed that all soldiers and airmen get on buses. That I had already prepositioned inside of the armory, and we had uh, military police escorts. We have a military police battalion in the District of Columbia National Guard. And I had Air Force security forces, um, which is the equivalent of Army MP. So they're security forces. We had vehicles, mark, sirens, lights. And we were just, you know, I decided we were going to go. And <laughs> thankfully, my what's called a JAG is the judge advocate. He convinced me not to do it uh, but there might have been seven people like i told my my command sergeant major he pushed back a little bit but once i said hey we're doing it he he said yes sir and then other subordinate leaders but the lawyer uh he just he stood in the way and he said i can't let you do this sir and i'm i'm grateful now but i was frustrated with him as well because Here's what he told me, he said, not only do you have a verbal direction, you have it in writing, two letters. And uh, I showed those letters when I when I provided testimony to the United States. He said, you just can't um, violate that. So so the United States, we're all we're all about civil military relations, civilian control of the military. So although I seriously contemplated and perhaps would have done it and paid the consequences, would have probably resigned and, and still would have probably been dealt with. Um, so that fidelity is to the civilian control of the military. We just have to have it. And we have to be thinking with discipline. And and I might have been thinking with emotion during, during, that, during that time. Excellent. He also served in the drug, the DEA, and as Deputy Director of National Intelligence Coordination Center. What should people understand about the dangers of drug trafficking and its effect on national security? So, so the dangers of drug trafficking are considerable. 2021, 100,000 Americans perished because of drugs. And I don't use the term overdose. One of my daughters is a, a farm D. She's a pharmacist. It's not a dose. It's drug abuse. 2022, 107,000 Americans perished due to drug abuse, drug use and abuse. And my former colleagues at DEA have an initiative, One Pill Can Kill. So some of these young Americans, and they're not all young, but mostly young Americans, will try to experiment with the drug, fentanyl, lactique, and there's a whole host of drugs, uh, Trank, which is an animal tranquilizer that uh, Noxalone won't help you. So. The, the problem we have in this country with drug abuse, deaths, we wouldn't accept this from any other nation that was killing our people. So the effects of drug trafficking, drug abuse, drug use, there are considerable consequences. We, we have to get a hold of it because we're losing our, our, our most precious uh, resource, our, our, our young people. So if we don't get in front of this, find a way to stop it. I don't think we've done enough to to educate the public beyond the temptations of drug drug use and drug abuse. We haven't been forceful enough on transnational organized crime and organized cr criminal groups who bring this poison into the United States and push it on sometimes unsuspecting people. Uh, so I'm, I'm, 
I'm frustrated by that as well, that so many Americans are dying. So from, from prescription drugs that are abused, um, from drugs that have been, uh, prescription drugs that have added fentanyl and other drugs, you know, we already had enough with cocaine and crack and methamphetamines. We, 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 we need to get a hold of this. General. It's a direct threat to our national security. Clear and present danger. Thank you, General. I, I wanted to uh, ask you to, to, to shift a little bit. You spent several years working in military intelligence. Uh, what is the role of intelligence for the National Guard, and how is this important for U.S. national security? Yes, yeah, so, so the National Guard, we have what's called military occupational specialties, as does everybody in the military. So in America, there is one army, and that's the United States Army one army. So we're all trained um, field artillery, military police, infantry, things we would not use domestically. So as an army intelligence officer, I was trained to find, seek, find, understand, know the enemy, never lose sight of the enemy, understand the enemy's capabilities, vulnerabilities, motivations, intentions, disposition, strength, weaknesses, morale, most importantly being probably the capability followed by intentions. So as a, as a National Guard <laughs> intel officer, one week in a month and toward the end of my career, a lot more than that, we studied threats and what we knew about people who meant us harm. So it was no difference as a National Guard intel officer as it would be a National Guard medical officer, medical service officer, a National Guard nurse, doctor, pharmacist, dentist. We, we, we practice uh, on the weekends and during the week when we do our two-week active duty phase, and it's all about sustainable readiness so that we are an asset for the Department of, Department of the Army and ultimately, the Department of Defense and the President. Excellent, excellent. General, you worked with the NATO International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan and also worked at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. Why were having NATO partners important and what lessons did you learn from this experience? <coughs> yeah, so so we, we can't, we should never fight alone anymore. We, we need to have this, what, what NATO does is make sure that the NATO members have the resources beyond their capability when that happens. Now, we're the strongest, most powerful nation with the most lethal and sophisticated military in the history of man. But we still need partners to get the job done effectively uh, to defeat the enemy and create peace and stability. So we, NATO is absolutely vital to everything we do. I, I don't foresee the United States having, um, having to respond to any kind of significant um, war or conflict without our NATO allies and partners. Vitally important to have this uh, interlocking shared sense of responsibility. So, so all NATO members are protected by all NATO me members. So I, 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 I enjoyed serving at, uh, I, I was assigned to ISAF, uh, the International Security Assistance Force, as a um, theater operations detachment leader for the Center for Lessons Learned. And then I was dual had it, had a, another job to work at the embassy in the office of uh, management transition. So it was, um, you know, we were busy, but it was a tremendous opportunity to serve. But NATO is vitally important, always will be. 
General, I'd like to ask you, in your opinion, what are the greatest security threats facing the United States now, and what do we need to do to prepare for them? Well, the, the greatest threats, I think we, I'll, the big four, Russia, well, China now, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. So, so those, and I, and I think we have a pretty good plan to, to deal with aggression coming from those four. We can't forget about, you know, ISIS, Al Qaeda, which, which I think we're prepared for as well. Um, but you have to include the, this, you know, internal challenge. I think we, we could implode as a nation where we have this internal strife and, and dissension where, um, you know, as President Lincoln said, uh, a divided house cannot stand. And I, I think that's a, that's a big threat that we have to deal with it as well. Um, uh, this uh, extremism, uh, racial extreme extremism, these groups. So uh, think about what happened in Buffalo, New York, and then what happened in Texas, where uh, these lone wolves are out there just trying to ignite a, a fire. And, and I think if that ever, and I don't know that it's not coordinated. I don't know if it's not planned. What I think happened in, in those two cases, and there are others, the the synagogue, the synagogues that have been, um, you know, attacked by people heavily armed and to kill people. I think at times that is there somebody trying to ignite this internal fl fire that will eventually destroy the country. So I worry about that. In addition, you know, to the to the big four that I named, uh, those countries want to change the dynamic, change um, how the world is is operating right now. I, I think China sees itself as um, as a major player in the in the very near future. Uh, Russia, you can see what they're doing with Ukraine. I think they want to return to a place of prominence in in, in the world. Um, so so China, Russia. Uh, followed by North Korea and, and Iran, in, in my mind. Uh, but we also have these transnational criminal organizations who could destabilize our economy, um, cyber cyber criminals, ransomware, um, cyber attacks. It, it, I mean, so what what I try to do as an intel officer and as a strategist, strategist when I was wearing the uniform, I would try to think about what is unthinkable, what is inconceivable. And then I would try to put that into a cascading dilemma. So we, we've got, a, and also uh, I just made myself think about bioterror. So those, those are things that I, I believe could harm us. If a, if a nation state decided, you know, I, I can't go up against the United States. Um, it, I have to have an asymmetrical approach, you know? So I think those are things that I, I, I honestly believe that the Department of Defense has people thinking about what's possible and then developing a plan to either prevent or mitigate and recover from it. I mean, I, I think that way. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, General, you have experience serving both parties. You were nominated for the promotion to Major General by Donald Trump, and you worked with Nancy Pelosi to be selected as Sergeant of Arms. What is your secret for maintaining good relationships with both political parties? Well, well it's not really a secret. Um, I've considered myself to be, when people would say, you know, are you a Republican or a Democrat? I would, I would answer, I'm an American soldier. That was my answer, um, and that's how I conducted myself. It didn't matter um, when when I was promoted to Brigadier General, of the district in the in the District of Columbia National Guard, the Commander in Chief of the District of Columbia National Guard was President Obama. Um, so what what I brought 
to to whatever I was asked to do. And, and in the Drug Enforcement Administration, I I was promoted, put in positions of increasing responsibility and trust under President Reagan, President Bush, President Clinton. So it just, in both careers, it did not matter. Uh, the secret was not really a secret. My fidelity was to the Constitution, the, which I, I gave it. I don't know how many times I gave it, but I and I said it, I repeated it for all promotions from second lieutenant to major general. And I gave it to countless officers and I never read it. It's not that many words. I internalized them. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter. So help me God. That's the most important part of it. You got God involved. So when you state your full name and you make that, you swear or affirm that that's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to do. And um, at one point in my career, I followed the philosophy of General George Marshall that professional officers don't even vote because it doesn't matter who the commander in chief is. The commander in chief is acting on be quite the, the people put him there and it's all about what the people want and the constitution. So, so I, I wish I had a secret, but I don't, that's, that's how I was able to, to get the job done for, for the speaker and get the job done for the former president. General Walker, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. <clears throat> it was a great pleasure and an honor uh, for both of us to speak to you and to hear from you and to hear your thoughts on these important issues. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to do this. Well, you're very welcome. I hope I got after the, uh, the questions. Thank you.